Hi everybody and welcome to the Groundwater Festival. We here at the Crane Trust are happy and proud to be a part of what you guys have going on today. Um, we are proud of our ability to protect and maintain habitat for roofing cranes and other migratory birds. My name is Josh Weesey. I am a habitat ecologist here at the Crane Trust and I study plants and pollinators and their response to habitat management. Um, I have with me my coworkers, Alex and Jenna, and they're going to share a little bit about themselves. Hi, I'm Alex Vogel, and I'm the Administrative Assistant at the Crane Trust Nature and Visitor Center. So I am stationed out of the Visitor Center, so I do a lot with public outreach. And I'm Jenna Malzahn. Um, I'm a junior wildlife biologist, and I help a lot with the long-term monitoring research and doing uh, habitat studies on river otters. We thank you guys again for being a part of today, and hope you guys enjoy our pollinator talk and short activity afterwards. It should be a lot of fun. At the Crane Trust, our mission is to protect and maintain the physical, hydrological, and biological integrity of the Big Bend area of the Platte River so that it continues to function as a life support system for whooping cranes, sandhill cranes, and other migratory bird species. We are the Crane Trust, so most assume that all of our work goes to protecting the cranes. That is not entirely wrong. We disk the river to clear vegetation or cranes. We do prescribe burns to promote native plant species and maintain open tall grass, prairie, and wet meadow habitat to provide food for cranes. But it's not entirely correct either, because the work that we do benefits more than just the cranes. So let's first start with how we protect and maintain the physical and hydrological integrity of the Big Bend area of the Platte River. A braided river like the Platte is a wide, shallow river made up of ever-changing sandbars and channels that branch and rejoin. Characteristically, braided rivers form from steep source waters with high water flows that carry large sediment loads of sand and gravel along the river's bed. Braided river valleys are often several miles wide, with river banks that are erodible, which add more sediment to the system. These features are maintained by seasonal flooding and ice jam events, which clear sandbars of vegetation that would have otherwise stabilized them, and floods the lowland areas with water, replenishing the groundwater reserves. Once that by settlers as a mile wide and an inch deep, the Platte River has undergone drastic changes since the mid 1800s. Industrialization and agriculture have altered the river's hydrologic processes. Massive flooding events, flow rates, and the severity of seasonal ice jams are reduced as the water flow in the river is controlled by damming. This causes sandbars to become stabilized by vegetation, which restricts further sediment flow. It also allows trees to become established, which stabilizes the riverbanks and alters the open lowland habitat adjacent to the river. This impacts many species, including cranes who rely on shallow open sandbars for protection during night roosting, shorebirds who nest on unvegetated sandbars, and native plant species that rely on the disturbance of flooding events to prosper, as well as countless others. Because these disturbances rarely occur naturally anymore, the Crane Trust imitates these disturbances to help maintain the physical and hydrological integrity of the Big Bend region of the Platte River. Vegetation is actively removed from sandbars by disking to open nesting habitat and decrease the stability that can lead to permanent sandbar formation. Stands of trees along riverbanks are also cleared to decrease water uptake, promote natural erosion along riverbanks, and reduce sediment accumulation. We also actively manage for invasive plant species through chemical applications and controlled burns, which promotes native plant species growth and maintains the open tall grass prairie and wet meadow habitat on our properties adjacent to the river. By imitating these disturbances, we are also maintaining the biological integrity of the Big Bend area of the Platte River. The disturbances create a diverse mosaic of vegetative communities in different successional stages, providing habitat for numerous native species of insects, amphibians, reptiles, mammals, and birds. Pollinators are just some of the species these diverse vegetative communities provide habitat for. And since you'll be making seed bumps today, which are targeted to best support a wide variety of pollinators, I will focus on them. Monarch butterflies are one of the pollinator species of concern in our area. They are a widespread species and easily recognizable with their large size and striking pattern. They migrate from Southern Mexico to Southern Canada using successive generations in the spring and a reproductive pause in the fall, and they are dependent upon milkweed plants. 
Less than 1% of native tall grass prairies where milkweed plants are abundant still exist today, and herbicides have removed milkweed plants from crop fields and roadsides, leaving very little habitat for monarchs and aiding in their decline. Another pollinator species of concern in our area are regal fritillaries. They are a butterfly species endemic to a specific type of tall grass prairie, and they rely on violets for food and thatch for shelter. Because of their specific habitat needs, they too are declining. Numerous bumblebee species and other species of concern are declining as well due to habitat loss and pesticide use. There are about 20 bumblebee species in Nebraska, and they, along with the monarch and regal, are essential in pollinating native flowers and keeping an ecosystem functioning properly. The work we do at the Crane Trust to maintain and protect the integrity of the Big Bend area is essential for these species, but there are ways you can help too. Making seed bombs is a great start. So how do plants move naturally? Plants have evolved over millions of years to develop ways of moving themselves across the globe. Since plants are rooted in the ground, the only ability for them to move is through their offspring in the form of seeds. However, plants often compete for space, light, water, and other resources. And therefore, it is important that the seeds move away from their parent plant so they are not outcompeted and given a chance to grow. This phenomenon is known as seed dispersal. Plants use several tactics to disperse their seeds, including wind, animals, water, and other pretty creative ways. Which mechanism of dispersal is characterized depending on the shape, size, and structure of the seed or seed pods? When dispersing plants develop special structures that are part of their seeds. These structures are designed to increase the surface area of the seed and allow them to be picked up by the wind and carried to a new location. Some plants, such as milkweed and dandelion, and cottonwood trees, accomplish this by silk-like structures that serve as parachutes and allows the plants to be carried very far. Other plants, like maple trees, have seeds that have a wing-like propeller that is carried away by the wind and falls to the ground looking like a helicopter. Another common tactic of seed dispersal in plants is by using animals to do their, their dispersing for them. Plants put huge amounts of resources and energy to make lushy, flavorful fruits such as apples, blackberries, cherries, and many more that animals and humans like to eat. Once eaten, the animal carries the seeds inside the fruit with them as they travel and pass the seeds through the poop in a new location. Other plants, such as walnuts or oak trees, produce nuts which are commonly picked up, buried, and stored for winter by animals like squirrels. Often squirrels will forget where they buried some of the nuts for winter, which will grow up as new trees. Other plants use a different strategy to disperse their seeds with animals by producing structures with prickles or barbs on their seeds that are specifically designed to attach to an animal's fur. I am sure most of you have been in a place where you've gotten plants like foxtail, cockleburr, or sandbur stuck in your socks or poking at your feet at some point in your lives. The structures on these plants act like little hooks to latch onto the fur or to clothing. In fact, this natural mechanism was the basis for the invention of Velcro. Other plants use a totally different strategy by relying on the buoyancy and ability to float. These plants fill their seeds up with gas pockets, which allows them to float down rivers, across lakes, and even across oceans. The coconut is the most ex impressive example of water seed dispersal. Coconut's large seeds have allowed the coconut tree to be dispersed all over the world in coastal areas and ocean islands. Another strategy used by plants like the lotus flower uses water to carry their seed pods, which drops seeds one at a time as the water carries them around. The last mechanism for seed dispersal is through a plant's own innovation. Some plants, such as violets and witch hazel, use explosive force caused by pressure and tension built up in the fruits or seed pods to launch their seeds far away from parent plants. These natural methods for seed dispersal were once enough to spread seeds through vast areas of connected prairie and wetland habitat. Unfortunately, today very little habitat remains for wildlife, especially in central Nebraska. What habitat does remain is scattered and fragmented by cornfields and human development. Slowly, these habitats are being stitched back together through restorations by conservation organizations such as the Crane Trust. To speed up the dispersal process and quickly reestablish habitat, human intervention is needed. Conservation organizations explore many technologies to replant habitat for wildlife. Common methods that have been used for ages include seed spreaders and native seed drills to broadcast or plant native seed in much the same way we plant crops. 
Other new mechanisms are currently being explored, such as drone technology to map and plant seeds across the landscape. In a recent effort to explore other new ways to disperse seeds, conservationists are using some fun methods to get both citizens and their friends involved in creating habitat for wildlife. Pollinator seed is now being deployed using cannons, firearms, and even dogs. Pictured here, you can see a couple examples of dog dispersal, which uses a special harness filled with native plant seed. Dogs can quickly cover areas that are hard to get to and can be a powerful ally in enhancing restorations with wildflower seeds. The cannon method uses compressed air to launch seed bombs into the air, while other methods incorporate blue rock sheeting and uses seeds for the buckshot, which has helped some hunters come to appreciate the hand they can have in creating and restoring wildlife habitat. The pollinators that are in decline depend on native plants and habitat restoration in order for their populations to stabilize. To make sure we are providing the types of plants they need to succeed, we focus our efforts on collecting massive amounts of native seed. We can do this with the help of volunteers for hand collecting special seeds that are rarer in our prairies. We can also use seed collecting machines to gather large amounts of grass seed, which provide important structural components to the habitat of a prairie and groundwater fed wetlands. After the seed is collected, we dry the seed out and clean the seed from the leafy plant material throughout the fall and winter. At this time, native seed is ready to be dispersed to create habitat. Today, you are all going to be habitat creators for pollinators. We'll be making seed bombs with native seed that you can find innovative ways to disperse them yourselves. Every little bit counts when it comes to habitat for pollinators. Today, you get to learn how to do your part. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Crane Trust Laboratory. Um, here, we're gonna lead you in a little activity to make seed bombs. And uh, my name is Josh Weese again, and I'm the habitat ecologist here at the Crane Trust, and this is my friend Jenna. Uh, I'm Jenna Balsam, and I'm the junior wildlife biologist here. Well, today we're going to make seed bombs. So you all should have received a little kit like this, and you guys aren't going to need too much. We give you the kit. You should need about a gallon of water and a container to mix things in. And I'm going to let Jenna explain what's the kit. Jenna. Yeah, so in the kit, you'll have a bag of potting soil, a bag of native seeds, which you're gonna uh, want to go through and make sure to take out any large sticks because it'll hinder your making of the seed bombs. Um, and then turn it all up. You have a nice big pile of clay pellets. Okay, so first thing you're gonna want to do is take your clay pellets and pour it into your container. Okay. All right, have something like this, and then we're gonna add our water. Um, we're going to add about a quarter of a gallon at a time and mix it up and try to get the right consistency here. And we're just going to go ahead and start mixing around. Your hands will get dirty, so you might want to have some paper towels or something nearby to wipe it off with. Yeah, definitely a wash station. So you'll see it'll start clumping right away. So we're going to have to add a little bit more water here. And we're just going to keep mixing it until all those dry pellets start to come together and form. You see it start to clump those little balls here. So go ahead and pour some more in. And we're just going to keep mixing. Go ahead. Each of these students should take a couple handfuls or a handful of clay about that size and bring it back to your table. Uh, teachers, this might be a good time to uh, go ahead and put some paper down or something on the table to keep the table from getting extremely dirty here. So, once you got your little clay pellet, you're going to take a oh, the size about the size of a golf ball, okay, and then you're going to smash it flat. Then you're going to take about a size of a quarter of potting soil and put it on top of your clay ball, like that. And then you're going to take your seeds that you guys should have cleaned out and, um, and go ahead and put about a quarter to maybe a dime size pile of seeds on there, okay? 
what I want you guys to do is just work it around. Make sure you work the seeds and the clay and the fine soil all together. Okay. And what you want out of these is about oh, a little bit smaller than a ping pong ball size. So like I made this size, but I can definitely break this smaller, break it in half. Then you have two for one. And then what you'll do is you'll take your seed bombs and you guys will find a dark, dry place to store, maybe a closet or something like that, and let them dry. And they'll be able to stay like that for um, quite some time before you need to fill them out. Or you guys can choose to throw them out um, at any time um, before then while they're still wet. So you're going to want to look for um, the right kind of places to throw these out. These are going to be places that don't get mowed very often. Um, that are usually away from people's yards. Um, you can do that in your own backyard if you get permission from your parents, though, and start a little colony the garden there. Um, we also recommend not throwing them in people's cornfields and places like that, but ditches, fair game. So, um, so you guys can all take these home and uh, throw them out and go back and visit the place that you threw them out um, six, seven months later and, and see what, what comes up. There's a lot of uh, different wildflowers in here. There's over 300 species in these mixes. And so every seed bomb you make is a surprise. So um, I encourage you guys to get out and make some seed bombs and have fun. Thank you.